I like even the the story behind the name rest and be thankful these people <laughs> hiking up the glen and then pausing just that they managed to get through it and they were thankful that they got up the pass yeah well if you've ever walked up the slope which you probably haven't walked up the slope of uh, you know the, the the unstable slope you probably want to rest and be thankful halfway up there it's very steep it's just about on the limit of being able to do it on on your feet without using your hands Welcome to CIHT Podcasts. This year, the BBC wrote a piece on the rest and be thankful with a headline that included the phrase, an infamous road through a mountain in torment. That description of torment was from 1913, indicating that the challenges of the location, perhaps the most challenging site that Transport Scotland manages, have been long running. The A83 runs for almost 100 miles from Loch Lomond to Campbelltown at the foot of the Kintyre Peninsula. The one section near the rest and be thankful has become infamous for landslips, closures and long diversions. Welcome, I'm your host Justin Ward and today I'm joined by Professor Mike Winter. As part of CIHT's Climate Change Pledge, today we explore how green infrastructure and in particular tree planting might be a solution to a road long tormented by landslips. Welcome, Professor Winter. Can we just start by setting the context? How many landslips are there a year? I think that's a really good question, Justin, and it's one I'd love to give you a really simple answer to. Um, And I will give you a simple answer. Up until about 2014, we had round about 0.8 to 0.85 landslides a year, so just less than one per year. And that's for the period where we have really pretty decent records about late 1990s to early 2000s up until 2014. Now, as you may have noticed, that rate seems to have increased somewhat over the last few years. Certainly this year in the general area, I'm aware of at least four different groups of events at different times, although I wouldn't suggest that the frequency is now four times per year. But to put that in context, we're looking at a relatively short period. I have records, some of them courtesy of a another colleague in the south of England that showed the most ancient one we're aware of is about right about July 1884 and then we've events that we're aware of in 1913, 16, 17, twice in fact in 1917 and through the 1920s, 1930s and 1940s and I've been working at that site since about 1990, 1991 and I would suggest that since then roughly it's been about one year. But of course, that time scale, even if we go back to 1884, it's only about 100 to 150 years. It's not very long in the geological or indeed the geomorphological time scale. And that's the time scale in which these slopes are modifying. And of course, what they're doing is under the action of gravity, they're tending to become flat. That's what gravity does. So we're looking at quite short time spans within this. And we are seeing a changing climate. And I think that's partly the, the the issue that increased rainfall patterns of increased rainfall mean that the the effects on that means that thousands of tons of earth go into Glen Crow after sort of those downpours, and 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 the impact of that can be quite considerable. I think the main road once it's blocked, the old military road can be used, but if that's shut as well, then it's a 59 mile diversion, and that creates pressure for a longer term solution. I think the briefly, what are the kind of economic impacts of closures on on the kind of areas affected? You've seen the effects of climate change, Justin, and the, the diversion. There's no doubt about it. It's very disruptive. It is very long. It's it's the 59 miles is actually closure point to closure point. So, for my journey from Edinburgh to the site, it perhaps adds about 15 to 20 minutes to the journey. I couldn't tell you exact mileage, but it's not 59 miles for that particular journey. The people are probably most hit are in Loch Lock Gilpaid, I would suspect, because they are right on top of the landslide. They have to get the 83 very close to the closure. So their diversion is very long and that's reflective in those figures. But the costs, the, the data we've generated over the last few years looking at economic impacts of landslides suggests that it can be up to about £80,000 per day. Now, that, that's quite a substantial figure. There's no doubt about it. But equally if you would consider a closure of say a major road in the central belt of scotland i'd expect those figures to be much higher i think the key thing here is it's not just the cost of the closure it's the impact on the communities 
that, that are served by the 83, and that's perhaps the most important thing. But I mean, certainly Transport Scotland since around about 2008, 2009, when we published the implementation report for the Scottish Road Network Landslide Study, has done a lot of work with uh, public information and awareness campaigns. It's installed warning signs which switch on during uh, periods of wet, very wet weather when we anticipate the landslides. And a lot of the work we've done, myself and colleagues have done, has been underpinning the evaluation of those signs and actually how we trigger them. There have been landslide patrols for bad weather periods. There's, of course, been the debris catch fences and the debris catch pits, which are being reconstructed. And then, of course, as you mentioned, the old military road to provide an alternative passage when the 83 is closed. So quite a lot of work being done and a lot of evaluation of those uh, measures as well. But there are still longer term solutions that are being explored. I'd like to explore what, what's been considered and then perhaps we can look at why tree planting has been uh, one of the measures that's been put in place. I don't think it's the only measure, but what other things have been considered? Have Has a tunnel been considered, for instance? Well, it was considered um, as part of the earlier options strategy. Um, I believe it's rejected. Um, tunnels are very, very difficult. Um, they're very complex structures. They're very expensive structures. Now, the, the alignment of a tunnel there is particularly difficult. If you were to take it from, for example, in Glen, Glen Crow through to the other side of the pass at the rest, and be thankful, you would have to go under the Lochan there. And even doing that, coming out the other side of the Lochan, the gradient would be around about 7%. The EU directive on tunnels requires a lot of additional physical safety measures once the gradient exceeds 3%. So it'd be a very expensive tunnel, even by tunnel standards. The other option, of course, would be to go from the Arica side all the way across to perhaps Kendown. That is a very, very long tunnel. And again, a very, very costly option. Of course, that's largely about board tunnels, but similar rules apply if you look at covered tunnels, but also most of the ones you see in alpine areas initially switzerland and so on and so forth these these are designed for avalanches now avalanches are pretty heavy duty events they cause a lot of damage but the density of the materials the snow that comes down is a lot lot less than the debris that would come down for example rest me thankful it might be three times the density that sort of order of magnitude at least what that means is the structures would have to be that much bigger in order to carry those dynamic loads, to resist those dynamic loads, if you like. So whereas you see the one, the sort of structures that are for avalanches are quite big structures, and certainly some of the ones I've seen initially are huge, to cater for the debris, they'd have to be that much bigger again, much more concrete, much more steel, and have a really quite significant, very significant impact on the aesthetic quality of Glen Crow particularly from the car park at the rest and you think for the head of the pass, which is somewhere but I personally think is an incredibly beautiful place. So certainly up till now, the plan has been about a wide strategy. So all the issues I mentioned earlier with the longer term measure, which forming, you know, importantly forming part of the strategy is tree planting, not scheduled to begin next year. Now, there may be some delays due to COVID. It wouldn't be the only thing that's been delayed due to COVID, but that's very much something that's on the table. It's very much something that's in planning. Part of the fencing works have already begun to fence the site to keep help keep deer out. And that's quite visible on the hillside already. But I think the important thing is not to think in terms of solutions, but in terms of a strategy which includes a number of different components, like the debris catch pits, like the fences, like the old military road, forestry, or the, the vegetation planting, and so on and so forth. We were involved in a report a number of years ago that was called Ecological and Related Landslide Mitigation Options for the A83, Rest and Be Thankful. And one of them, I mean, I, I quite like the quote, just fix the hillside, dynamite it, like they do in the rest of the world. Why would that not work? I mean, th this was a very interesting one. This was one that came, this is yet, 
excuse me, this was a suggestion that came in from a member of the public to, I think, the transport minister at the time. Um, and that was their suggestion, do it like they do in the rest of the world. Um, now, I, I've been working this arena for, oh, I guess, 35 plus years now. I have never come across anywhere in the world where they just dynamite a hillside to fix a landslide instability problem. Um, it simply doesn't work. I mean, if you were to dynamite that hillside at one level, what you might do is shift the loose material off the hillside. Now, the, the, the quantity of that material is vast. It would be a multi-year operation to remove that loose material and doing it safely. I'm, I'm just not sure how you would do it. You would also expose the, the rock material beneath, which is highly prone to weathering so all you would be doing is just exposing that material to weather more and create more loose material over a period of time so certainly our conclusion was that that was not a viable solution um and i did actually ask a couple of international colleagues of mine whether they'd ever come across that solution and to be honest the answer was absolutely not and for all the reasons i've just mentioned it is not a viable solution and that's exactly what our our report concluded i'd like to just ask one question on livestock, because I know that was considered in the paper also. Could you tell me what the thinking was around about livestock, particularly on the site of the rest and be thankful, but also maybe how some of the thinking was informed by international research? Yes, well, I mean, we were conscious that there were sheep, deer and cattle on the hillside. And we wanted to understand a little bit better what the effects of them would be. So we did a little bit of work looking at which had the most compaction effect and that turned out to be the deer with relatively small hooves and quite big bo heavy bodies but this was very much in the context of trying to understand how they changed the morphology of the hillside so there was some work done in what was at the time burma what's now myanmar way back in i think the 1960s uh, which i actually used for my phd thesis many many years ago where somebody actually it studied the use of elephants for compacting earthworks, slopes, um, constructed slopes. And what they found is the elephants were very, very effective at compacting the soil. But the elephant would the elephants would track across the soil, put the feet down, and then the next elephant would put their feet in exactly the same spot. So what happened was you ended up with some very highly compacted areas surrounded by some completely uncompacted, some loose areas. You tend to get the same thing on the hillside. So the beasts traverse the hillside, creating nice compact paths, which are great. The water then flows very readily across those paths, straight into areas that are uncompacted. In addition, when they settle down for the night, they tend to move the bodies around, rub the vegetation off, expose the soil, creating yet another path for water into the soil. And of course, water getting to soil is exactly what creates the instability. So the plan is um, a fence is going to be fenced, the livestock, the sheep and the, and the cattle will be removed from the hillside in due course and the deer will be kept out. So they won't actually create these problems. And also the deer in particular won't eat the newly planted vegetation. And now on to the, the main focus of today about vegetation planting, the benefits and disbenefits of that. Could you outline those and then? explore that in a bit more detail yes well i mean the, the main benefits of vegetation are threefold really that firstly they the roots can bind the soil together secondly the roots will also take up water they'll suck water out of the ground and dry it and make it a bit more stable but the leaf structure also has the potential to attenuate the rainfall reaching the ground. So if you like to slow it down. Um, and there's a lot of work being done in British, British Columbia, in Canada in, Canada in particular. Um, and they've looked at the difference between conifer trees and um, deciduous trees and found that perhaps counterintuitively that um, conifer trees are a bit more effective at attenuating rainfall than deciduous trees. But I think if you think about plantations of the two different types of tr trees 
then if you imagine walking under a conifer forest, then actually very little rainfall gets through. It's simply because the trees are very close together. The, the density is very close. To, the density of the, tr the branches and the, the leaves are very close. And also, of course, they're big there year round. Uh, whereas for deciduous trees, that's a seasonal effect almost. If you they concluded that the best option for, for this particular purpose is conifers. But of course, there are different contexts to this, you know, in the UK and in Scotland, of course, we we must use native species. We don't want to induce, introduce um, potentially other problems by introducing non-native species. Species, Japanese knotweed uh, springs to mind, for example. So has to be native species. The other thing is that there is a danger that if we use a monocultural approach, then what we end up with is the roots simply create a raft. So we could create a greater hazard. So the plan is very much mixed vegetation, um, different types of shrubs, which have different root structures. So some will have deep root structures, some will have relatively shallow spreading root structures, and some will sit somewhere in between. Now that's something that's being taken forward by Forest and Land Scotland. They're the experts. I'm not an expert on vegetation at all. And the report you referred to from, I think, 2012 or 2013, was the result of the work that we did in parallel with what is now Forest and Land Scotland. And the, the tree species that were put in there were simply examples. And I think that's moved on somewhat from there. There's, a, there's quite a detailed plan there. But in terms of potential disbenefits, apart from the issue of creating potential raft, there is also the potential that if we don't manage this vegetation, then we end up with very big trees in 50, 60, 70 years time, which themselves present a hazard to the road, road using public. And that's something you want to avoid. We've experienced this in other parts of the network. And the plan is to use relatively low height forms of vegetation, certainly not plantation type trees, and for that to be managed within limits. And when do you envisage the benefits of the planting to take take effect? That is a really, really good question again, Justin. Um, the, the, the site is actually quite high altitude. At road level, it's something like a couple of hundred metres above sea level, and that obviously rapidly increases as you, as you head up the hillside. So we, we, we are pushing the boundaries of where um, Forest and Land Scotland have actually planted before. So it, to some extent, it's uncharted territory. Our estimate in the report was somewhere between 15 and 30 years to be fully effective, depending on the altitude. It's also, as you be aware, it's quite an exposed site. Um, that's one of the reasons we get so many landslides there. Um, so there's a there's a great deal of uncertainty around that. One of the one of the big issues that's an unknown is how much of that planting we will lose before it establishes. And that that is an unknown. It's a genuine unknown. So, and that is one of the reasons why we will be um, treating this as a trial and monitoring what happens on the slope. And there's been a lot of sort of talk about biodiversity and rewilding. Do you mm -hmm. see this as a kind of measure for that, the sort of also the, the carbon benefits of tree planting? Are those elements that have been kind of factored into the thinking? Yes, in, in a fairly holistic sense, I think. I mean, Certainly the benefits of biodiversity, I think, are fairly clear. And that's apart from these, if you like, the structural, the beneficial uh, effects on instability. That's one of the reasons why we're looking at multiple species. Um, it just makes more sense. We're not trying to create commercial timber here. We're trying to manage a slope. In terms of the carbon, yes, there will be benefits. Um, there will be carbon locked into the slope, additional carbon locked into the slope. But... It would be wrong of us, I think, to see this as something that's going to make a major contribution. I mean, some years ago, um, some colleagues and I did some work um, for the Scottish Government about how we could use the, the road network and the, the sort of, if you like, the landscape areas around it to lock in carbon. And the calculations we did suggested, and this is all published on the Transport Scotland website, I believe, um, suggested that 
in order to capture the carbon generated by the trunk road network, just the strategic road network, the motorways and the main A roads, not the local road network, every year, we would need to plant an area the size of Edinburgh each year and maintain that in perpetuity. So yes, it will have an effect, but it will be a small effect. It's a bit like everybody doing their recycling. If everybody does the right thing, that aggregating those small effects becomes much larger, but on its own, it's small. And you've touched on comparing international practice. Has similar exercises been taken elsewhere in the world that helps provide a kind of benchmark for this work that's undertaken here? I'm not sure I'd use the word similar, but I, th- I think related is perhaps the word I would use. Um, I mean, New Zealand is perhaps the most obvious example, and there are areas in the South Island, of the South Island where veg- pl- vegetation planting has been used to stabilise or help stabilise hillsides. Not aware of any where they're above a public road. So they're in they're on sites where the risk is much lower, if you like. I also came across an example where a lot of vegetation um, has been used to help stabilise a major landslide in China a few years ago. But there, unsurprisingly, it's completely different vegetation types, as it is in New Zealand. But in China, they were using bamboo to do that. And of course, in the UK in the past, we've used willow poles to help stabilise smaller slopes. Um, But on this scale, this is really quite different, I think certainly for the UK. Um, And as I say, I don't think we've seen the same context elsewhere in the world either. Do you think there's any other questions that would be good to good to ask? Um, I suppose what we haven't covered is the where we're going in the longer term. A few years ago, there was an option study which looked at both routes within Glencrow and other potential routes in in the immediate area. Now, there's another study going on at the moment, really, I think, in response to the significant events we've seen both this year and in the preceding years, which is again taking another look, a fresh look at routes within Glencoe, routes in the immediate strategy, but also a much wider, more strategic look. I should say I'm not involved in this in any way at all. So this is just my sort of personal interest here. but those more strategic looks are taking, as I understand, are taking a look at how the people of Argyle or of Mid-Argyle access their surrounds and how everybody else accesses Mid-Argyle. So I believe what, one or more of the options is to actually look at a bridge or a, or a ferry route that actually comes out south of Glasgow. There are others that come out quite a long way up the 82 on Loch Lomond side. So it's a real much more strategic planning type look at how vehicles, how and why vehicles, people and goods moved in in and out of the Mid-Argyle area. So some of the options look at first sight to be a bit, um, shall we say, strange. But if you actually think about what they're trying to do, they're just trying to assess how we move all these things forward in the future. Now, what's going to come out of that? I have absolutely no idea at all. Uh, but I think it's going to be very interesting. Well, thank you very much for your time. That was an interview with Professor Mike Winter. Thank you again, Mike. Thank you, Justin. Pleasure to speak with you.